All right, let's go ahead and get started. Stop sharing there. All right, welcome everyone to our Squirrel Field to Fork program. Um, we're really happy to have everybody join us tonight. Um, this is the first time we've hosted the Squirrel Field to Fork webinar virtually. Um, we have an awesome guest speaker tonight. So you guys are gonna learn a lot from him. Uh, and hopefully we can get you ready for the upcoming season because spring season opens uh, pretty soon. So I'll introduce myself for those that I haven't met yet. I'm Becky Wallen. I'm the Field to Fort Coordinator for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. I am a little new to squirrel hunting, but let me tell you, it's some of the most fun I've had in the woods. Um, so I really enjoy it. It's uh, something that I can enjoy with other people. Um, so if you're looking to go out with a small group, this is a great um, activity for you guys to enjoy together. And uh, we'll go ahead and I'll let Cody introduce himself. Cody's our guest speaker tonight. Hello, everyone. It's good to see everybody. My name is Cody Roden. Um, hopefully you all can hear me. So um, tonight I have a presentation prepared um, and hopefully I'll be able to share that. <clears throat> and then as we're moving through the presentation, if you guys want to put any questions you have in the chat or um, raise your hand or anything, I don't mind if we stop the presentation and um, chat a little bit as well moving through. So please, uh, if you think of any questions or um, I know in my brief experience or in my experience with uh, individuals hunting squirrels or thinking about squirrels, there's been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of lore and um, entails associated with squirrels. And so if you have any of that stuff you'd like cleared up or anything, please, um, please uh, ask the questions and, and we can talk about it for sure. And so with that, I think I'm going to try Becky to share my screen. Okay, let me see. Okay, can everybody see that? Open. Yes, we can see it, Cody. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Becky. All right, so as I mentioned, my name is Cody Roden. I'm the Small Game Program Coordinator for Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. And I have my contact information here, and I'll have that again at the end of the presentation, and hopefully Becky will send that out maybe in the chat. Um, but please, if you see anything here, you didn't get an opportunity to ask me a question, or if you just want to talk about squirrel hunting or small game in general, um, please give me a call or shoot me an email, because um, I love talking about this stuff. And so for this presentation, I kind of broke it up into two main parts. One, kind of <clears throat> the Department of Fish and Wildlife, our efforts for small game in the state, and then uh, moving on kind of into squirrel biology. So as I mentioned before, this is kind of a slide I put in a lot of my presentations. Um, it's kind of how the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife is broken up administ administratively. So just bear with me um, through this. Let me see if you guys can see this. Can you see the little laser pointer? Um, hopefully you can. So we're led by a commissioner. He's here at the top. And then we have deputy commissioners. And then we have different divisions. So I'm in the wildlife division. Um, Becky's in the information and education division. We have a law enforcement division. Um, the men and women you see out in the field in uniform. Uh, we have an engineering division, individuals that do things like build boat ramps and, and things along those lines. And we have several other divisions as well, a fisheries division, you know, that takes care of the waters um, in our state. And then within the divisions, we have directors, assistant directors. And within the wildlife division that I'm a part of, it's kind of broken down into two tracks, the programs and the regions. So over here, I'm in the program. So I'm a program coordinator for the small game program. And so we have several programs in the wildlife uh, division. We have things like the big game program, they take care of um, deer and elk, the turkey program, they take care of turkeys and grouse and things along those lines. So just to give you kind of a over, really brief overview of how we're structured, um, I'm in the small game program and there's biologists in the program and they're kind of species experts um, in their programs. Not to say I'm an expert by any means, but that's just kind of how this is supposed to be set up. 
And so as I mentioned, um, I'm in the small game program. And so we define small game in Kentucky as these four groups of species. So the first one here, rough grouse, is actually not in my program. So I'm not responsible for rough grouse, but they are considered a small game species in Kentucky. What I am responsible for is northern bobwhite, um, the cottontail rabbit species in the state, of which there are three, and the tree squirrels, so what we're going to be talking about today. And so gray and fox squirrels are the two species of tree squirrels that we're able to hunt in the state of Kentucky. There's a third tree squirrel species, the flying squirrel, and this animal is um, very nocturnal. Um, if you've ever seen one, consider yourself lucky. They're, they're pretty common, but they're just super nocturnal and very secretive, um, but they're very small. They're like a quarter to an eighth of the size of a gray or fox squirrel. Um, and they have flaps of loose skin on their body. And they're really neat critters, but we're not allowed to hunt them here in Kentucky. And so we hunt gray and fox squirrels. So I'm gonna review kind of some of our efforts for small game in the state. So the first one I'm gonna talk about um, is our hunter cooperator survey. And so this is a survey that we send out um, every single year, every single hunting season uh, to our squirrel hunters. So we send this log out to them. We ask them if they would be able to fill out each one of these um, rows each day that they hunted. So they fill out things like the day that they hunted, the county they hunted in, um, the number of hunters they had, if they use dogs or not. So dogs is a cool thing that Becky will talk about a little bit later in the presentation. And things like number of fox and gray squirrels you saw uh, wounded or killed. And next for um, squirrels in the state, we do a mast survey. So mast is a word that I'll be using a lot in this presentation. And that simply means the fruiting body of woody plants in the state. So acorns, that's mast. Um, hickory nuts, that's another mast. Um, things like blueberries, uh, that's soft mass. So there's hard and soft mass. But anytime I say mast, I'm just talking about um, tree seeds and nuts, um, bushes, things like blackberry, blueberry, stuff along those lines. And so for the mass survey, here's just a quick example of some of the things we report on in our mass survey. So we're looking at four main groups of trees. So we have a white oak group, um, and I'll get more into what exactly goes into the white oak group, um, a red oak group, a hickory group, and then the American beech trees in the state. And so from this, we publish things um, out into the public from the program, telling people, you know, kind of, what is stocked in the woods for this year, right? So this was um, the 2020 mass survey, the most recent data we have. Um, the 2021 mass survey will be ran this August. And so we run these surveys right before our hunting seasons to try to, try to give sports people kind of an indication of, you know, what's out there for wild animals to eat. So mass is really important, especially from these four groups um, of trees for everything from, um, white-tailed deer to, to turkeys to some extent, and especially um, to tree squirrels in the state. And so there, I just put this third bullet point in here. Here's some stuff we do um, for the other small game species. Remember I mentioned we're working with uh, bobwhite quail as well as, um, as rabbits. And so one thing a couple of things we do for those is our rural mail carrier survey. We had a statewide quail plan that recently came to a close and we're working in um, the production lands in Kentucky trying to get individuals to plant kind of like wildlife friendly um, forage for their for their cattle and livestock. But again, we won't be talking about that. Just had to throw that in there. All right, and so here's some of the data and I promise this is like the second to last graph I'll be showing you all um, this evening. But so here we have some data that we have compiled through time from our hunter cooperator survey. And so here on the X axis, we have the years starting with 1998 all the way to the most recent season, the 1920 season. Um, and over here on the Y axis, we have rate of fox squirrel seen per hour and rate of gray squirrel seen per hour. So the rate per hour is it's not really uh, important to understand completely what that means, but a higher rate per hour means there's more squirrels. Um, sports people saw more squirrels while they were in the field versus a lower one, um, they saw fewer squirrels while in the field. So a couple, two things I like to point out in this graph. Number one, if you were to put a trend line down across all these data points, we kind of see a very flat line, which is good, right? A flat line means that our squirrel population is very stable in the Commonwealth over the last 20 years. Um, we believe that the, the squirrels statewide are abundant and stable in their population. The second thing I like to point out is, so the blue bars here represent the number of fox squirrels seen 
and the orange bars represent the number of gray squirrels seen. So as you can see, we, uh, we encounter as sports people out in the field, we encounter a lot more gray squirrels than we do fox squirrels. And here's some data from our uh, mass survey. So again, here, um, just focusing on the x-axis, we have years 2007 to 2020. Um, and again, here, 2007 to 2020. And here, each one of these graphs represents each one of those four tree groups that I mentioned earlier. And on the y-axis here, we have essentially the percent of the tree that was bearing any hard mass. So again, we can think of this as how loaded down was the tree with, um, for instance, for this white oak, how loaded down was the tree with acorns, right? And so again, a couple of points to take from this graph. You know, on these mass survey routes that we have, most of which are on wildlife management areas, we're seeing a pretty consistent, um, if we look through time, we're seeing a pretty consistent um, mast contribution from these four species. And that's why these four species will be focusing on these when we talk about squirrels. You know, these, these four species groups of trees produce a really high quality um, nut. Think of a big, nice big hickory nut. Um, and they're also pretty consistent, okay? So they are going up and down every single year. And that's a whole another really cool conversation we can talk about, but maybe we'll save that for next time. Um, but essentially, the couple of things to take away from this is we have consistent, good mass producing trees um, on these mass routes through time. And so some of the threats uh, that we're looking at within the small game program that um, may change the good news about squirrels. So again, the good news is we have an abundant squirrel population in the state and it seems to be pretty stable. Um, here's some things that might challenge us moving forward. And so the number one thing I have here is changing forests. So as we're talking about the, the oak trees, the hickory trees, and the beech trees, you know, those are groups of really good trees. And so what we see happening in the state of Kentucky is um, a lot of times individuals will go in and harvest um, the best of those trees in, in their plot of land. So say they own 150 acres of forested habitat, maybe in the eastern part of the state, and they've gone in every 40 or 30 or 40 years and harvested the best of those oaks, hickories, and beech trees. Okay, so if we do that over and over, um, if we do that too many times, we'll have fewer good trees left um, in the forest to reproduce and also produce mass, remember hard mass, those seeds um, for wildlife. And so we're seeing this with some other regional data. Um, there's, there's more um, moist species trees, so shade um, tolerant trees, things like uh, maples and hackberry and stuff like that, which are, which are good trees, but they're not as good for wildlife as our oaks, hickories, and beech trees are. And so this could be a major factor moving forward. Um, disease and parasites I have listed on here. And so disease and parasites, um, first of all, are two things that, you know, occur in all healthy ecosystems, right? Um, and again, that might be hard to believe or hard to buy at this point with COVID-19 and all that stuff, but disease, disease is a part of all healthy systems. Um, and with squirrels, especially tree squirrels, it's kind of a minor factor. Um, and this comes from a bunch of studies with squirrels um, looking at how, how much disease actually weakens and kills these animals but it can cause regional decline. So individuals maybe in a small pocket of isolated forest um, could see a small population decline in that area. But when we're talking about statewide issues, it's much, much less of a factor um, than our changing forests. And then lastly, and definitely um, the most minor would be predation. So these animals have kind of um, developed through time to, to generate good survival tactics, right? So they, they become um, pretty much, they live in the trees, they get away from a lot of predation. Um, they get eaten by a lot of animals. So everything from a rat snake all the way to um, owls and hawks, you know, so, and everything in between, coyotes, bobcats, you name it. But they, um, as we'll see moving forward a little bit, they have some tactics to try to get around um, any take from predators. And again, that includes us. You know, uh, we've been hunting squirrels in Kentucky for a very long time and with pretty consistent bag limits, which I'll get into a little bit more in the next slide. But, you know, predation from us and from other animals is, is really a, a very minor factor, but one we should keep an eye on. All right, so here's just some general um, outlines for our seasons and bag limits. So there's actually two separate seasons in Kentucky um, 
four tree squirrels. So the first one is in spring uh, from mid-May to mid-June. It's actually coming up um, this weekend. It opens uh, from this weekend and then closes in mid-June. So a pretty short season, about a month long. And then we have a really long season um, from August all the way till uh, February of the next year. And so hunting squirrels in the state of Kentucky, this is one of the longest seasons among game animals, you know? So if you're just starting out hunting um, or if you wanna get in the field more, hunting squirrels is really something you can do um, to hone your woodsman um, skills between different seasons. So say you really like hunting deer, well, you can get in the woods and hunt before and after the deer season to again, try to hone those skills of sneaking around in the woods um, and sitting still. Maybe you're trying to sit still for turkey hunting um, this is a really good way to practice some of those skills. And uh, so as far as our bag and possession limits, our bag limit is six, which again is, is pretty high relative to a lot of game species we have in the state. And our possession limit or the, the amount of animals you might possess at one time is 12. And so this again might sound high relatively, but um, think back to that graph that we showed earlier um, where we believe that the number of tree squirrels in the state again is pretty stable. And these, these bag limits have been in place um, for pretty much that entire time. Um, so again, we're, we believe that the squirrel population is in a state that can handle kind of some of these more higher bag limits. But I will mention, we do use the hunter cooperative survey and some other metrics um, to make sure that we're, we're being accurate in how much we can actually take um, from the population. And that's what the program biologists are tasked with, right? So these are the people that are looking at the species. So the, the turkey biologist looks at how many turkeys are harvested and, and make sure that that is within the bounds of what the resource is able to handle. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears here for a second, um, or for the rest of the presentation actually, and talk about um, squirrel biology. And so the first thing we gotta talk about, you know, we're talking about these two tree squirrel species we can hunt in the state. Um, the first one is fox squirrels. And again, fox squirrels are seen a lot less than gray squirrels in Kentucky. Um, and actually, you know, I grew up in East Central Illinois, which was right on the edge of kind of the corn desert um, in that part of the state. And so it was a lot of open land, a lot of fragmented forests um, and not huge blocks of contiguous forests like we are blessed with in Kentucky. And so I hunted almost exclusively fox squirrels growing up. I shot a lot of fox squirrels, rarely ever even saw a gray squirrel. And so it's actually kind of an interesting dynamic that fox and gray squirrels have. They can inhabit the exact same habitat but they'll never be exactly the same density. One or the other will always be more or less than the other one. Um, so if there's a bunch of fox squirrels, we're gonna see very few gray squirrels in that patch of habitat or in that patch of forest. If there's a lot of gray squirrels, again, we're gonna see fewer fox squirrels. And that does have something to do with the fact that fox squirrels do key in more on you know, wood edges. So think of a, a pasture next to a forest, they're gonna be right in the edge of the woods um, whereas gray squirrels like that more intact forest. Um, so fox squirrels are, are larger than gray squirrels. As you can see in this photo, um, they have much different coloration. So they're orange, uh, a little reddish, um, kind of with an orange light belly. Um, and again, they live more in open areas. And gray squirrels on the other hand are smaller. They're about half to three quarters the size of a fox squirrel. Um, they're gray with some brown. They'll have some brown on their face and, and on their tail and they have a white belly. So that's a really key indicator, they have a white belly. And again, they live in more contiguous or more intact forest land. And so one cool thing um, that I get contacted a lot about um, by the, the general public, um, again, squirrels are things that, that we see a lot in the woods, we can go hunt. And they're also things that we can see, you know, in town at our bird feeder. And they're fun to watch. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later. But actually, fox and gray squirrels exhibit some of the highest variation in fur color morphs among mammals. Okay. And so there's three actually technically different types of color um, morphs that they can exhibit. So the first one is melanism, which is darker fur. So if you were to see an all black squirrel, that's in Kentucky, if you were to see an all black squirrel, that's still a gray squirrel. It's still the same species. It's just a color morph. Um, and, and the all black squirrels, the melanism trait in Kentucky is not that common. Um, it's more common in the northeast part of the country. So areas like Vermont and Maine and New York, um, up in that neck of the woods, Pennsylvania. Um, what is more common in Kentucky is this leukism or lighter fur color. And so I have these three pictures here at the bottom and all three of these were taken in Kentucky. And so here on the left, we have a, a light 
fox squirrel, right? So we can tell it's a fox squirrel because of its orange tail. Um, it's kind of still got orange paw pads, but the rest of its body is lighter, um, and that's leucism. And again, same thing here in the middle. And then here on the right, we have two gray squirrels. One that is the normal coloration, the one above this one with the white tail. And this one here, again, is e expressing leucism um, in its fur, so it has, again, a lighter tail color. Um, and lastly, we have albinism. So albinism or an albino squirrel. And so that's something, it would be completely white and that's pretty rare, okay? And so and you'll hear terms like for other animals, maybe you've heard of piebald, like a piebald deer. Um, and that's referring to leucism or an albino deer, which again is a total lack of pigment, um, thinking about red eyes and stuff along those lines. And I will also mention, you know, this is, this gets, these color morphs get so extreme in the southeast part of the country, so Kentucky and south down to Alabama and down around that area, there's actually nine subspecies of gray and fox squirrels that are actually differentiated solely based on their color morphs. All right, so we'll talk a little bit here about squirrel reproduction. Um, and so as I'm moving through kind of the rest of the slides, I kind of try to angle this a little bit to try to help us be more successful um, squirrel hunters. So when we go afield, um, maybe kind of try to think of some of this information about how can I use this and apply it to the chase, apply it to hunting, right? So squirrels are able to breed at around one year old. So a one year old squirrel is able to breed. Um, breeding activity starts um, by chasing. Uh, in January and February. And again, so there's a second breeding period in June and August. And so I'll get back to that chasing thing here in the next slide. But the breeding activity starts in January to February. And then again, it starts back up June to August. And so gestation or the amount of time that it takes a mama squirrel to birth the pups or the little baby squirrels um, is a little over a month. Um, it's about 44 days. And so two to three young are born uh, between March and early April. And then again, if the if mama squirrel had a second litter, those animals will be born August to early October. And the young um, need about two months of parental care, uh, maybe a little less than that, before they're ready to strike out on their own um, and be, uh, be sub-adult squirrels and be able to exist on their own. And so I will take a brief moment here. If, you're, if you remember um, on the season dates, you know, some of these season dates that I mentioned before, you know, mid-May to mid-June and August to February are two squirrel seasons. It is possible for sports people in the field to harvest a squirrel in the very beginning of those two seasons uh, to harvest a mama squirrel that has babies that need her in the nest. And so, first of all, I'll say that we've known this the entire time. We as biologists and the people that are keeping track of this have known this. And you know we're trying to maximize the amount of time our sports people can be in the field, and also trying to maximize you know um, how much that resource can take. So how much can the squirrels? How much harvest can the squirrels take? And so so far, if you remember that graph again, it's been pretty consistent the squirrel population through time. So we believe that um, hunting these squirrels at a time in which we might be taking a parent out of the picture is definitely it's it's okay to the resource. Um, However, if you, have a, if you have a personal issue with this, and I, that's totally understandable, it's a really easy fix. So if you don't wanna potentially harvest a female that has pups in the nest, um, just go ahead and start your hunting um, later in that early season. So maybe start around June 1. And then in the, the later season, the season that's in August to February, go ahead and start your hunting in October. If you did that, there would be a very, 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 very slim chance that you would harvest a female that had pups in the nest that still needed her. Um, so I'd just like to mention that. Cody, we did have two questions come up, come up about the color morphs. So I wanted to go oh. ahead and ask them now. Yeah, um, thanks so much. Yeah, the first question, Rafaelita was wondering if you're allowed to harvest an albino squirrel. I believe so. Yes, that it, you are able to hi, uh, harvest an albino squirrel. Um, I'm like 90% sure, I believe so. Do you, is that what you believe too, Becky? I'm, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's correct, yep. okay, okay. I'm pretty um, sure that's too. That's a really great question, yeah. It is. Um, the next question from Evan was, he was wondering if the color morphs have any p impact on reproduction. Yeah, that's a really great, great question. And to my knowledge, they do not. However, the fact, okay, so that's a really good question too. 
I don't believe so, but I will say this. Um, there has been some genetic um, research done on some of these color morphs, and it appears that these are recessive traits. And so not to get too far into the minutia of this, but a recessive trait um, can be lost through time. So if a, if a white squirrel, if a white fox squirrel breeds with a normal fox squirrel, um, you know, maybe those pups will be white or maybe they won't, right? Because the, the trait is recessive. It might take a couple more generation and that whiteness pops up again. There are populations of these color morphs that exist through time, which means that it's probably happening where two white squirrels are breeding together. And then you have a higher chance of having offspring that are white, right? Does that make sense? And so it's possible just knowing that, that if anything, maybe more commonly colored morphs are attracted to more commonly colored morphs. But again, that research has not been, um, unfortunately has not been looked at yet. That's a great question. And we had one more pop up, uh, same topic here. Is there any biological reason you couldn't or shouldn't eat a squirrel with a color morph, especially melanism? Yeah, that's another great question. And no, not whatsoever. They're totally 100% safe to eat. Um, and there's nothing wrong um, with harvesting and eating a squirrel that does have a color morph. It's I think simple. that covers it for now. Okay, thanks so much. It's a similar process to how, and this can't be thought exactly the same, but it's a similar process to how our human hair turns gray, right? It loses um, some of those pigment um, receptors that that generate that coloration um, in our hair, right? And so it's, it's that's all it is, um, especially when it comes to melanism and leukism. Yeah, so those are some great questions. Please keep them coming. Um, and so I mentioned chasing earlier. So, and this is something you all might've seen if you look out your back door at a bird feeder and you see two squirrels chasing each other. Um, this chasing activity is actually a lot of the times it's two squirrels getting ready to breed. So this will happen again, you know, in the spring and in the winter, uh, animals will start chasing each other. That's the very first sign of um, a breeding status. Okay, and so we'll just I'll try to play this. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm gonna play it now. And so as you can see, these guys are, you know, I'll mention more about this later, but squirrels are social critters. Um, however, a lot of this chasing activity does have to do with breeding. And I'm showing you all this. Um, this is obviously in a backyard, but if you can imagine this happening in the woods um, in fall on some dry, crunchy leaves, you know, this is going to make a lot of noise. Um, and so you know, keying in on this when we're afield and looking to try to harvest these animals, um, this is a great indicator if you hear a bunch of rustling of leaves, just like all hecks breaking loose. If um, you hear a lot of uh, the animals claws on the bark, if they're running up and down the tree really fast. And so if you're really quiet and they don't know you're there, um, sometimes we'll do this in the forest. And again, it makes a lot of noise. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk kind of about squirrel behavior. And so um, squirrels are a pretty researched um, taxa or group of animals, um, and so we know a lot about them, um, or we think we know a lot about them, right? Um, but I've kind of broken this up into four uh, discrete categories. So the first one's habitat. Um, the second one, we'll talk about movement. The third, we'll talk about communication. And the fourth, we'll kind of talk about diet. Um, and so a lot of this, again, is slanted towards, you know, how do we use this information to be more successful um, sports people? All right, so first of all, squirrel behavior habitat. And again, habitat's just kind of referring to where do these squirrels like to live? Um, and and what, what vegetation, what plants are around that would um, benefit squirrels the most and have the, the highest density of squirrels, right? And so we're looking for areas that have high density of squirrels and those are the areas that we want to hunt. And so squirrels, again, they're mostly eating hard mass and we'll get into to their diet a little bit more. Um, and so they like to be around their food sources, right? We like to live close to the grocery store, you know, or the gas station. Um, squirrels and, and all wildlife uh, like to do the same things. And so we have some indicator tree species that we can fall back on um, that will help us find more squirrels and where these guys like to live. And so the first tree species, and again, um, 
it's no coincidence that these are the four tree species groups that we survey for the mass survey, right? And so the first one is our red oak. So that's up here. And a red oak um, is pretty easy to identify. Um, if, if the tree has leaves on it, just look up at the leaves and we'll see this kind of classic oak looking leaf, right? And it's a red oak if the leaves come to a point at the end. That's how we know it's a red oak versus a, a white oak or some other tree species, right? And so if these points, if these leaves come to a point at the end, it's in the red oak group, okay? And so there's actually several species that make up the red oak group. It's things like um, Schumard oak, um, Southern red oak, things along those lines. If you ever heard those terms, those are all in the red oak group um, of species. And so next we have the white oaks. And that's here just below the red oak group. And these again have the classic oak looking leaf. Um, most of them do. And these, the difference between the white oaks and the red oaks is the white oaks will not come to a point at the end. They're pretty heavily lobed here. They're more rounded. And so that's how we know um, that that's a white oak group. And so again, there's, there's chestnut oaks, um, swamp white oaks, things like that. And they're all in the white oak group um, of species. You know, next we have hickories. And uh, hickory leaves are what we refer to as compound leaves. So this is one whole leaf here, and then we have um, five leaflets. So these are big, huge leaves that kind of look tropical um, in our eastern forests. Um, and again, have usually have pretty big um, fruiting bodies, pretty big nuts. Um, and lastly, we have the beech trees. So um, the beech is more easily identifiable by its bark, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But the beech trees has kind of a smaller leaf, and it's a little serrated on the end, so it kind of looks like a little steak knife. And then it has kind of this um, hairy-looking um, fruiting body here. And so if we're cruising through the woods and we're wanting to see good squirrel habitat, you know, we have these four tree groups, and uh, we're looking at kind of trees about the size of your waist and above, okay? And so we're not looking um, for early successional habitat, or we're not looking for young forest, um, forest that's about uh, the size of a baseball bat, right? We're looking at big kind of open park-like woods. Um, and again, this will, a lot of trees about the size of your waist and, and going up. And so here we have a couple examples of those four species groups. So here on the left, we have a red oak. And so red oak, and again, I'm showing you this um, because oftentimes when we hunt squirrels in the fall and the winter, there are no leaves on the trees. So we have to come up with kind of different identifying factors or things that we key in on um, to see what good squirrel habitat looks like. And again, I'm just, I'm showing you these pictures. You might know what this stuff looks like, but it's all about kind of keying in on that search image. You know, as you're walking through the woods, you start getting that feeling, uh, okay, this is gonna be good squirrel habitat. Maybe I should sit here for a little bit to see if some squirrels come out. And so we can tell red oak pretty easily by what's known as these ski tracks. So this is kind of commonly known as ski tracks. So if you look at this bark, it kind of looks like somebody just went in and shaved off like these raised fissures through the bark, right? And this kind of goes all the way up the tree, especially in older trees, larger trees. This will go all the way up clean to the top of the tree. Um, and these are called ski tracks. And it's a really good indication of a red oak um, species group. Now on the right here, we have um, two hickory trees, okay? And there's some hickories that have tighter bark, but um, the good shagbark hickories and, and things along those lines, um, shellbark hickories have this real sloughing bark. So it kind of almost looks like this tree's, you know, about to die or something, right? It looks like the bark is falling away from it. Um, these, these two trees are really good for squirrels. And again, we have hickories here on the right and a red oak here on the left. Okay, next we have the other two groups we talked about. And so here on the left, we have a beech tree. So beech trees are really easy to identify in the forest. They're kind of these only one, the only ones that are big and have this real smooth bark. You know, oftentimes you'll see people have carved their initial or something into them, um, but they'll be big and real smooth bark all the way up to the top. And then here on the right, we have our, our famous white oak. So white oaks um, have kind of this, it kind of looks like an alligator's back, you know, um, and it has some sloughing bark a little bit. Um, and some trees look similar in their bark to white oaks, um, but white oaks again will have this white oak leaf um, with these heavy lobes um, and then acorns as well. And so white oaks are, are actually preferred um, to a, in a lot of wildlife species, squirrels included. Um, and so they're not only great for, for making bourbon, but they're also really good for making um, good squirrel habitat. 
And so again, as we are cruising through the woods, you know, it's, it's, um, it's November, December. Um, again, there's probably no leaves on the trees at this point in time. Um, there's a lot of leaves on the ground though, right? And so one thing we can key in on in good squirrel habitat is what does the leaf litter look like or what do the leaves on the ground look like? And so when oak leaves fall to the ground and dry out, they kind of start to curl up. And so what this, what, the, what happens here is the leaf litter gets real duffy and thick. And so if you're walking around and you feel like, man, I can't even see my feet here, it's, it's possible or probable that that's a nice oak hickory forest. Um, and so those leaves, again, as they fall, they dry out and curl and they'll be um, real fluffy um, and kind of, kind of deep in that, that litter and duff. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some trees that do not represent good squirrel habitat. And so again, these trees are, these trees are fine. They could be good for maybe structure for the squirrels, but these trees do not um, produce uh, those good mast species that we talked about before, or those good um, acorns and the, and the good groceries that the squirrels want to get after. So they're not gonna spend a lot of time um, in forest with a lot of these trees. They might be passing through or uh, might climb up there to get some sun, but these are areas we might wanna keep walking if we see some of these trees, a lot of these trees um, in this part of the woods. So here I'm showing you two maple trees. And so we can tell the difference between a maple tree and some of the other oak species. Um, it usually has deeper fissuring in the bark and some of the, if it does have sloughing bark, it's still attached to the tree. Um, and so remember the shag bark, that stuff was looked like you could just pull it off, right? And so this stuff, um, a lot of the sloughing bark, it will be still attached to the tree. We'll find these trees kind of down towards the bottom um, of, a, of a draw or a run. So as you can see in this picture, we're kind of mid slope here. Um, this will, they'll be found more in moist areas. And so we get some more moss, some more green moss on the trees. Um, and here we have another one kind of, you know, tighter bark, um, kind of more consistent pattern moving up and down. And so these two trees, again, are maple trees and trees that are not as good um, for squirrels and which would probably hold fewer squirrels in this part of the woods. And again, um, kind of looking down, again, we're in poor squirrel habitat here and we're looking down at the ground. Um, again, we're hunting at a time when there's not a lot of leaves on the trees. You know, what does the leaf litter look like in poor squirrel habitat? So here we're looking down at the leaf litter and these leaves, you know, they kind of, it seems more flat. I know it's kind of hard to probably see, but these leaves are flatter and more close to the ground. You can see some even bare ground and dirt in these pictures, right? And so when a maple leaf falls to the ground, um, and if you don't know what a maple leaf looks like, just think of the Canadian flag, the red and white Canadian flag, that's a maple leaf right out there on the, on the flag. And so these leaves will fall to the ground and they'll kind of sit right on top of the ground. They won't curl um, and dry, they'll just sit pasted to the ground. And then, you know, leaves will sit up on top of it, sit up on top of it. And so if we're walking through the woods and we see very little leaf litter, um, especially um, in a lowland area, again, we might want to um, consider moving pretty quickly through that because there's not going to be a lot of squirrels in that area. All right, so now we're going to move on to uh, movement. And so we're talking about, you know, what are squirrels up to in the daylight hours, right? And so they have kind of um, an annual activity period. So there's two activity periods annually. So in the spring, summer, and fall, they're most active in the early morning and then again in the evening. Um, in the winter, this is a little bit different. So in the winter months in Kentucky, they're most active in the morning and through midday, okay? And so, and this has to do with kind of some of the stuff we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, um, but just remember, you know, if you feel like sleeping in in the winter a little bit, you're totally fine when it comes to squirrel hunting. Um, their highest activity period is going to be in early fall, so that late October, early November time period. Um, and again, that has to do with um, some of the activities they're getting, in, getting into at that point in time, which we'll talk a little bit more moving forward. All right, and so as they're moving around during the daytime hours, um, there's some signs that we can see in the forest um, that we know there's likely going to be squirrels moving around and being in this area. So the first sign are these um, large squirrel nests, okay? And these things are also referred to as drays. And so these squirrel drays are about the size of a basketball. They're oftentimes spherical, as opposed to a, a big 
um, osprey nest or a hair and rookery or something like that, um, which bird nests are more flat, right, and concave. These things are going to be spherical like a basketball. They're going to be made of twigs. Um, oftentimes will be made of leaves. And again, differentiating between um, drays and a bird's nest, the squirrel will live in this thing pretty much year round. Um, they'll live inside the dray. They'll go in there um, when it's raining or when it's really windy. Um, and, and they'll, they'll live in there they, and they'll also raise pups in there. So bird nests, birds only lay eggs and rear their young in the nest and then they live somewhere else, right? Um, in these drays, this is where squirrels hang out. Um, this is their house. And so if we see a lot of these in the woods at, at a certain spot, we might want to slow down or, uh, or sit on some of these to see if the squirrel comes out. And so I will also mention too, you know, again, as I mentioned before, they're, they're social creatures, you know, squirrels can share one dray. Um, and so that's, that's pretty interesting. One other thing that they might be doing um, is what this guy's doing here on the far right picture is sunning themselves. So squirrels um, to get oftentimes, you know, to soak up the sun, to, to heat their bodies up, or also to get vitamin D, right? We get vitamin D from the sun. They'll lay out on a branch um, pretty high in a tree and they'll kind of pace their body down to that branch. Usually a branch is about 90 degrees from the trunk of the tree and they'll sit up there and sun themselves. Um, especially midday in the winter. And again, if we think about the winter, we have shorter daylight periods, you know, and, you know, I know my own self, I need sunlight in the winter, right? And so these guys are doing the same thing. So one thing to key in on is kind of these taller upper um, branches in the trees and look really closely to see if there might be a squirrel um, sitting up there getting some sun. Okay, now we're going to move on to communication. And so one thing that um, our common misconception is that squirrels are territorial. And they're not actually territorial, um, but they do form kind of a social hierarchy. And uh, this is kind of like um, chickens. Uh, so they kind of form a pecking order, right? So the biggest boss male in a small area, like a, an acre or two or, or a couple football fields, um, everybody knows he has the first pass at the, at the best mass trees, at the best nuts. Um, and so they need to form that social hierarchy um, somehow. And it's usually by um, communicating vocally or sometimes wrestling and things along those lines. Um, and they're also very vocal if provoked. Um, and so let me see really quickly if this will play. And Becky, please let me know if it's too quiet and I can try to change that around. But this is a squirrel vocalizing or barking. So was that, were you able to hear that? Yeah, that sounded good. Okay. And so if we hear this in the woods, um, it tells us a couple of things. First, there's squirrels around, um, you know, and second, the squirrel might have seen us, right? And so it also tells us there's probably more than one squirrel around, right? So if these animals see us or see, you know, a possum or a coyote at the bottom of their tree, they might start barking like this to alert other squirrels in the area. Hey, you guys might want to be heads up. You know, there's something around here. Um, and again, they're pretty social um, with each other. They live solitary lives, so they live out on their own, but um, they like, you know, messing around with each other. And again, they have more communications than just this bark, but it is a very common um, communication that we should keep a very sharp ear out in the woods um, while we're hunting. And I see we have another question in the chat. Um, does a squirrel have to be a certain distance away from the nest before you shoot it? That is a great question, and they don't, they should not be in the nest whatsoever, but I do not believe there's a certain distance from the nest uh, before you shoot it, and I'll double check with Becky on that as well. Um, that's correct. That's correct, okay. Um, and again, you know, they use the nest as their house, right? And so, again, it's different than birds. Um, they're not using that. They can raise pups in the nest, um, but they're living in that house um, pretty much all day or throughout the year, right? And there could be multiple um, squirrels in there, but again, there's, we don't shoot the nest. That's, that's a big no-no. Um, but if they come out of the nest, then they're available to be harvested. That's a great question. 
All right, so now we're going to move forward into squirrel diet. Um, and so the diet of squirrels, they're they kind of been, as biologists, you know, biologists love to categorize stuff, right? They're completely obsessed with that. And so we categorize squirrels as being uh, granivorous or animals that eat mainly seeds um, and fruits uh, out in the wild. They can actually eat pretty much anything. So there's reports of them eating nestling birds, um, frogs even, um, eating meat, you know. Uh, there's a lot of, they've been able to eat a lot of different things. But again, the Q&N kind of on these three main um, food sources in Kentucky. And so that's acorns um, or, you know, red oak and white oak nuts, um, hickory nuts and beech nuts. So essentially they're moving all around through the woods looking for these, um, these tree nuts. They'll also eat the buds of trees quite a bit in the spring and stuff along those lines. But then, you know, around um, late August, um, September, October, uh, they'll switch on to eating like exclusively um, acorns, hickory nuts, and beech nuts. And so they'll eat some of these nuts and they'll pretty classically take some of them and cache them um, all across the forest, right? And this is known as scatter hoarding, um, if you ever heard of that term. And so they'll scatter hoard all these nuts um, out across the forest. And it's, it's, it's thought that they, they're really good at recovering the nuts. Um, there was recently a study that came out that actually found um, that maybe they're not so good. So, you know, the, some of the published stuff um, before this most recent study was they can recover about 90% of the tree nuts that they bury. Um, however, a recent study came out and said they're actually forgetting, you know, a lot more than they actually find, which, you know, as you can imagine, it's kind of hard to follow a squirrel around throughout the entire year or years and try to figure out you know, oh, he buried that one and he got that one. So, you know, the verdict's kind of out on this one, but in reality, if they forgot where they buried 74% of their nuts, they accidentally planted an entire oak forest, right? And so um, that's not actually a bad deal, right? And so there is some published accounts of um, squirrels in about 50% of the time taking an oak acorn um, and, and chewing on it and biting it in a way that it will not germinate. So they take it and they eat the embryo from the seed and then bury the rest of the seed. So the rest of the, um, the woody mass in the seed underneath the ground and it doesn't germinate, which is, I thought that was kind of an interesting um, tidbit. And so I'm seeing now too, we got another, um, another question in the chat, two questions now. So do they eat black walnuts? And that is a great question. And yes, they do. They 100%, they love black walnuts. The reason I did not put walnuts in this presentation or as, as highlighting as the top three is because there's, uh, there's a lot fewer walnut trees in most of the state um, than acorn or red oak and white oak trees, hickory trees and beech trees. So they definitely eat black walnuts. If you find a walnut tree in the forest, it's definitely a good one to sit on because they do like to eat black walnuts. And I see another question, does the type of nut change the flavor of the squirrel? That's a super interesting question. I am not sure. So that's actually a really interesting question because um, white oak acorns versus red oak acorns. So the reason why white oak acorns are preferred by most wildlife species is because they have less of this indigestible tannin material in them than the red oaks do. So white oaks are more digestible. They might even taste a little bit sweeter to the wildlife um, than red oaks. So it could be true that if a squirrel is munching on a whole bunch of undigested or less digestible red oak acorns, it might taste a little bit different than white oak. That's a really good question. And I'm not sure. I've never heard that, but it's possible for sure. Who knows? Okay, and so here's just a couple pictures of kind of their movement and their diet. So say this is um, December in Kentucky, right? Um, we have a gray squirrel here and he happened to remember where he buried this nut. Okay, so he's, he's come down from his tree He's gone over to the forest floor and he's rooting around and digging um, and he's found his nut and he's left. So what are we looking at here on the forest floor? We're looking at these circular um, concave holes in the ground, right? Pretty small holes. So these will be, you know, maybe like three or four inches across, right? They're pretty small holes. Um, 
And so this is a really good indication that there are squirrels in the area and that they have cash nuts in the area. So it tells us a couple of things, you know, one, there's definitely squirrels in the area. Two, these squirrels have been there for a, a while, right? They've been there long enough to get a nut in the fall, bury it, and then dig it up again um, in the winter. So this is probably a pretty good place to slow down and do some squirrel hunting. All right, so they grab their nut out of this hole. And then what they'll do is go up to a safe place um, in a tree and start chewing on that nut and eating it. And so you might have seen this at the bird feeder or something along those lines. They'll sit down and, and take their paws um, to eat the nut. Um, and usually what will happen is they'll go down, dig out the nut, go up, eat the nut. And then after they're done eating that nut, they'll go back down, go find another nut and come back to the same place, same tree um, to eat that nut again. And this again is they've adapted through time um, to find a safe place to kind of let their guard down, you know, eat their lunch and just kind of hang out and then they go back down. Um, and so an important cue here is if you see a squirrel cutting a nut or, you know, that's what's referred to as eating the nut. Um, if they're cutting a nut and you see them from a distance and they disappear, it might be a good tactic to go straight to that place, hide and wait for the squirrel to come back and start cutting another nut at that same place. And so when they're cutting their nut, cutting the nut, they, um, they drop the seed down to kind of messy eaters, right? And so what we'll see on the base of the tree or around the forest floor um, are these cut um, acorns. And so these things will be all chewed up. Um, the middle part of the nut, the woody outside part will be left in the middle part, the embryo and, and the, the, the kind of less woody part will be eaten um, out of the nut. So I see we have another question in the chat. Can they smell the nut that was buried previously. Yeah, so it's thought that um, there's kind of a couple things going on. Um, it's possible that they could smell it for sure. It's also thought that their spatial recall is exceptional. And so what that means is um, if you think about, you know, when you're walking around your house and all the lights are on, you have to go to the bathroom or whatever, then say you go to sleep and you wake up, it's pitch dark, but you have to use the restroom. How do you get there, right? Well, you kind of remember, you know, where the door was, where the wall is, you know, hopefully you remember where the dog was sleeping on the floor, right? And so squirrels actually have a, a spatial recall that's, you know, picture your bedroom to the bathroom. They have that for like six acres of forest. Um, and so it's, it's pretty amazing that they can hold this information in their mind where they can remember, okay, I'm putting this nut here and I remember and go back to, to spatially uh, recall where it's at and go find it again. Um, but olfactory cues or, or cues, um, them smelling it does uh, play a role, but not as much as their, simply their spatial recall, their ability to, to remember where they place things um, through time. All right, and so that's all I had. And so really quickly, we'll go through a little overview. So, you know, squirrels, gray squirrels and fox squirrels in Kentucky, we believe they're doing really well. Um, they're, they're stable throughout time. Um, there's some oscillations up and down, um, but for the most part, they're stable throughout time. Uh, they have a very long season and many sports people pursue them. So I, did, I forgot to mention this, but we think there's probably between 60 to 80,000 squirrel hunters in the state. And so these are people that, you know, also hunt white-tailed deer, um, turkeys, uh, quail, you know, but they also hunt um, squirrels. So it's a, it's a very hunted species in the state. And we probably harvest, you know, between 1.2 and maybe up to like 1.6 or 1.8 million squirrels um, annually. And so again, the squirrel population is resilient, um, as you saw in those graphs, and a lot of people um, pursue them. And so fox and gray squirrels um, are different. Remember, fox squirrels are larger, they're more orangish, and they inhabit more fragmented habitat. Gray squirrels are smaller, gray with a white belly, um, and they, they inhabit more uh, dense forests. And so they reproduce twice a year and they have two to three young per litter. And they live in hardwood deciduous forests. So these are hardwood forests um, where the leaves fall off every year. And they eat hard mass. So again, hard mass um, were those tree seeds and nuts um, from things like acorn trees and hickories and, and beeches and walnuts. That was a really good point. That's another um, source of hard mass in the state. Um, and they're most active during the early morning and in the evening, and they're especially most active during the year um, in the fall, um, in November, uh, around that time. And so 
Oh, we have a really good question in the chat that I forgot to mention. So will squirrels be out in the rain, um, light rain or heavy rain? And so that's a really good question and one I wanted to touch on. Um, and so with a lot of these studies, um, back to the, the squirrel um, kind of finding its nut study and, and how often do they actually find the nut, people have been following squirrels around quite a bit. Um, and so we know kind of their activities throughout the day, throughout the, the year and the weather periods. And squirrels will only really lay up and not move um, kind of in three different times, okay? The first time in which squirrels won't be moving will be really windy days. So really shaking those limbs around, um, very windy days, they're probably not moving very much. Um, the second one is very cold temperatures. So we're talking really, really cold, um, probably sub-zero in Kentucky. Um, that time they're probably just laid up in their drays in those leaf nests um, and trying to keep warm. And the third one is very high temperatures. So we're talking about like, you know, upper 80s, 90s, stuff like that. They're probably just trying to, to move as little as possible um, and trying to just keep cool. And so those are the three times which they won't be moving. All the other times, you know, light rain, light snow, cloudy days, sunny days, um, they're out and about, right? And so most wildlife, and I'll just, I'll just mention this too, most wildlife and huntable species in Kentucky are kind of the same way, right? These animals have to move, they have to eat every day. Some animals have to get water every day, right? And so, you know, if it's a light drizzle outside or if it's cloudy, you know, consider going out anyways. You know, if you plan to go out and no, no, it's, it's raining, go out anyways. I pretty much guarantee you, you're gonna see um, as many or maybe a little bit less um, squirrels than you would if you didn't go out, right? And so, Oftentimes we think, you know, all oh, the weather's not good for hunting. And many times it's as good as a bluebird day, right? Um, and so that's a really good question. So I see we have a, another question in regard to nesting. You mentioned that these are the squirrels' houses. Is this to say that they will stay near these nests yearly? And would it be a good idea to remember nest locations for following year hunts? That's another really good question. So they will it's possible for them to use the drays or the houses year after year. Um, it's also likely that the individual that was using that dray um, has been predated. Um, so a one-year-old squirrel, a squirrel that's born um, this fall has about a 25% chance to make it to the next fall, right? So again, they get eaten a lot, um, people harvest them and stuff. And so a squirrel could make a dray and then succumb to predation or disease. And then that, that house is empty, right? Um, also squirrels will, for whatever reason, they'll move around and make a new house, right? So maybe that one got infested with um, fleas or something and they don't wanna live in there anymore. So they'll leave again. So it is, what I'm saying is it's possible that they will inhabit those year after year, but it's, it's more likely that if they're inhabiting a dray in that year, that they'll stick around for that year, but then um, the next year they'll probably be gone. And I see another really good question about what gun is best for hunting squirrels. And Becky will be covering that. Um, that's a really good question. And Becky will be covering that in her presentation um, here moving forward. Yeah, thank you, Cody. Thank you so much for all that awesome information. Um, and yes, I am going to cover equipment here in just a second. Let me get my screen going. All right. There we go. Uh, I did want to mention that it's almost 830 and I just want to let people know that I'm going to go through, go ahead and go through the material. I'm still going to answer questions. Cody said he would hang out with us, but if you have to go, we want to respect your time and feel free to go. You won't interrupt anything um, and you can catch the rest of the webinar on the recording when it's posted later tonight. So um, first I'm going to start with hunting laws and regulations and Cody did already mention the seasons and that we have the spring season and the fall season. Um, just to let you know, the spring season is gonna open this Saturday, May 15th, 2021. So we're right on time. Hopefully we're getting you excited to get out this spring. And um, then of course the fall season will start in August. We'll take a little break for the weekend of uh, opening firearm deer season in Kentucky, but then squirrel season in the fall will open right back up 
and be open all the way through the end of February 2022. The bag limits don't change between the seasons and um, the shooting hours are 30 minutes before sunrise to 30 minutes after sunset. And you can be in the woods before and after that time, but you can't start hunting until that moment local time. So wherever you're hunting. So legal hunting equipment. You can use a rimfire rifle or a rimfire handgun. And typically the most popular rimfire rifle is a 22 caliber. You can use a 410 gauge handgun, um, which is a shotgun shell. You can use a muzzle loading or a breech loading shotgun that's no larger than a 10 gauge. And the breech loading shotguns, which you're probably most familiar with, um, must be plugged. They can't hold more than three shells. So that's just like our turkey season that we just got done with. You can have two shells that are able to be held in the magazine, in the two magazine of your shotgun and one in the chamber, but that's it. Um, so make sure you double check before you head out, especially if you just went turkey hunting with your three and a half inch shells and you're switching to game load for squirrel season with the two and three quarter inch shells, um, make sure that you can't put that third two and three quarter inch shell in your magazine of your shotgun. Um, you may need to cut a longer tube if you can. So you can use lead or non-toxic shot for squirrels that's no larger than number two. What we typically recommend is a shot size of number six. And when I'm talking about the shot size, for those that aren't familiar, that's the size of the pellets. Um, the larger the number, the um, smaller the pellets. So a number six is actually a little bit smaller. Actually, it's quite a bit smaller than a number two, but there's gonna be more pellets in the shotgun shell, which is gonna um, give you a better spread and, uh, but it's not so many pellets that you're constantly picking them out of the meat. And on the non-toxic topic there for shot, some of our public lands require you to use non-toxic shot. So anything other than lead, um, you've got the copper and uh, different things of that nature. You can find all of that listed online, what's um, legal for non-toxic. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has all of those lined out for us. And um, so just make sure when you're going to public land that you double check your regulations there. You can also use a muzzleloading rifle. You can use archery and crossbow equipment, pellets from a 177, 20, 22, or 25 caliber air gun. You can use a slingshot with a manufactured um, hunting ammunition for the slingshot. And then you also are allowed to use dogs to aid in the hunt for squirrels. And so I think I'm seeing some questions come up here. Um, so I hope that, let's see, what gun is best for hunting squirrels, shotgun or rifle? It's totally dependent on your preference. Um, and it's also maybe dependent on what time of year you go. So if you think about the spring, that's gonna, the season that's gonna kick in soon, we already have a lot of leaves on the trees. So you might opt for a shotgun um, that has more of the spray and then a rifle where you're really pinpointing your shot. Um, I typically hunt in the fall, so I typically use a 22 rifle. Hope that answers your question, Rich. If, if you have a follow-up, just let me know. Wade wants to know if the possession limit only applies while in the field. If I have 24 in the freezer, I'm not violating the law. That's correct. So um, your possession limit is for in the field or in transport, but not the freezer. Oh, Cody, you I see that you answered him. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, let's see. Is there a limit on the number of shells you can have in your 22? There's not. And speaking of public land, are there any WMAs close to Richmond, Alvin? Yes, there are. 
you have a really nice one. Um, the Central Kentucky Miller Welch Wildlife Management Area is right there in right south of Richmond. Um, I've frequented the that WMA, so check that one out for sure. And Wade, are dogs really important for a successful squirrel hunt? No, I have never hunted squirrels with dogs, um, but it is a really popular thing to do in Kentucky, especially in the eastern part of the state. Uh, so, and it really just kind of makes, it can make the hunt a little bit more exciting to see the dogs work and have that bond with them. Um, so if that's something you're considering, I do have another slide that we'll talk about a little bit of training, but I'm not an expert on training dogs um, at all. I do really good to get my puppies to sit. <laughs> so I would recommend doing a little bit more research on your own or reaching out. We, we have plenty of staff at the department who have trained a lot of uh, their own dogs for hunting. All right, just double check in here. Give me one second, on to the next slide. Here we go. Okay, so basic hunting equipment. Uh, you're gonna need your firearm or whatever method of take that you choose to hunt squirrels with. Something to carry your harvested squirrels in and keep them cool. So that's not just a cooler in the truck, but also how are you gonna carry them as you harvest them? A lot of times you can just carry them by the tail. I usually take a grocery sack or something really popular is an upland game vest and I have one to show you really quick. So we've got, you can typically find these um, in any sporting goods store. They usually have some orange on them and that's perfectly acceptable for, for squirrel hunting. Uh, we've got some really nice large pockets in the front and this big pocket in the back. So that covers the entire back of the vest. It's all open all the way through. Um, so when you harvest your squirrel, you can stick them in that back pocket and keep going, keep hunting. And it's not very thick. This material is real thin and it won't, it'll keep them pretty cool. Um, if you're not familiar with the area, or maybe even if you are, you want to have a map with you and probably a, a paper map as a backup. Have a good hunting plan. We wanna practice good hunter safety um, every time we go in the field. So let someone know where you're going and how long you plan to hunt and when you think you'll get back. Um, good tread shoes, ankle support, you know, is totally optional, but I'll show you. It doesn't have to be anything spiffy or fancy or expensive. I use these or a version of these. I have some Walmart uh, hiking boots that I really love and wear those a lot of times in the field. Earth colored, tone, uh, earth colored clothing and a hat. Camo is really not necessary uh, for squirrel hunting. As long as you can kind of blend in, your clothes are dull. I'll show you actually uh, just one set that I might wear out. So I've got my dark green and I know the colors are tough here. I got a dark green long sleeve shirt here and long sleeves key because you do want to still cover your skin tone up. And then I've just got some like secondhand old navy green pants. That's all you need. You don't have to spend a ton of money to go out. For my hats, I've just got brown hats right here. This one does have a little bit of camo on it. This one's just brown and they're darker brown and they don't have, they do have the logo on it, but it's really not that noticeable. So anything like that will work. You do not have to wear orange unless you are hunting for squirrels during an open modern firearm season for deer, bear, or elk in that area. So make sure you're paying attention in the fall while you're out. If it's overlapping those big game seasons for rifle, you need to wear your orange to be legal. Um, 
bug and tick spray. I'll show you what we use. We use the permethrin that's pretty popular. Uh, you can spray it on your clothes and it survives multiple washes. So we, uh, you don't put that on your skin. You're gonna wanna use DEET or something else for your skin, but that's what we use on our clothing. Obviously take water. I didn't put snacks in there, but I love taking snacks into the field and a seat cushion, which is totally optional depending on your hunting style. And Cody dropped the public lands map, uh, public lands map in the chat for you guys. Thanks, Cody. All right. So I've mentioned hunting style a couple of times. So really hunting for squirrels can fit a wide variety of, of people. Uh, if you're one that likes to be up and active, the spot or listen and stalk method might be for you. So if you're, that's where you're listening for those, the chasing and the call that Cody played earlier, um, and then trying to get as close as you can to put the, the animal in range for an ethical shot. And that does take as much patience as sitting still. Um, I have to say <laughs> that was one of the things I learned the hard way. Um, is that you really do have to sneak up on these critters. Um, you can also look for the habitat that Cody mentioned and the sign and sit in a prime location that's for a feeding area or among the um, tree nests, anything like that. We did mention that you can use the dogs and you can hunt from a boat for squirrels. So if you're gonna choose to um, try the boat option, just make sure that you have all the proper safety equipment on the boat so that the boat is legal and um, make sure that you have permission to go onto the property that you're hunting around, if you will, to retrieve the squirrels once you harvest them. So probably your best bet if you don't know the property owner on like a river system, um, you might want to start in some of our WMA, um, WMAs that surround our lakes or the Army Corps properties. You can hunt there. That's public access. Um, we talked about moving slow and steady, which can be tough. Take the shot when the squirrel pauses. They are moving quite a bit, honestly. And... Um, Sometimes they will, if they're barking, the call that Cody played earlier, they may pause to, to stare and bark. That's the perfect opportunity. Um, and you can sit still among the nest sites. Uh, when you're shooting, the most ethical shot placement is towards the head. Even with your shotgun, um, or especially maybe with your shotgun, you're going to have all those little pellets coming out. So the if you aim for the head, it kind of moves that shot pattern forward and you'll have less to pick out of your, the rest of your squirrel meat. All right, so training dogs. Um, like I said, I don't have a ton of, I don't have any experience training a dog myself, but I've seen trained dogs work and I've um, talked to the trainers quite a bit. So really any dog can be trained to be a squirrel dog. It doesn't have to be a specific breed. Typically you'll see smaller dogs out there being squirrel dogs. And I've heard that's because they don't run out of energy too quickly. Um, obviously a younger dog it could, is more of a prime candidate to teach it something like this, um, but really it could be any age dog as well. Using real squirrel pelts will help them um, really recognize that animal and you wanna leave the tail attached. So um, you might be asking squirrel hunters if they have these or harvesting squirrels just specifically for this purpose. Um, and make sure that you give the dogs some accomplishment during the training. So um, make sure that they are able to kind of get a hold of the hide and uh, feel that sense of, of accomplishment. Some tips for your, when you have dogs out and you're squirrel hunting, use a bell or a tracker during the hunt um, just to keep track of where they are. 
put their information on a collar and, and your information as well, just in case they get away from you. Um, and keep the dog, uh, keep up with the dog, give it, but give it enough space to hunt. So they're going to be running back and forth and they're checking and tracking, um, give them a little bit of space and that'll, <laughs> that'll kind of save your energy as well. Some big safety tips here. Don't ever shoot at a, a squirrel that's on the ground when you're hunting with dogs because the dog is likely chasing right after it. And so just let it get up a tree somewhere um, off the ground before you take the shot. And you might consider getting an orange vest for your dog. Um, and just for cuteness factor uh, and to notice that I, this is a little video I'll play for you, but you'll notice that this dog's behavior it's very energetic. It's treed the squirrel. She's um, jumping around there on the on the base of the trunk. And notice that her bark is a little bit high pitched. They you'll notice with working dogs that their bark will change when they have an animal that they're chasing or that they've treed. So I'll play this. And actually, I need to turn on my settings really fast. Bear with me. I want to make sure you guys can hear it. All right. All right. So hopefully you guys heard that pretty well. Let's see here. Okay, so I thought that was pretty cool to see. So talk a little bit more about public land opportunities. So there, you can see by this map, this is the interactive map that you have access to from our website at fw.ky.gov. And the each star is public access across the state. So it's pretty well spread out. There should be something close to you. Um, the properties vary in size, but most of them are wooded. And um, some of these are not just WMAs, the wildlife management areas that are owned or operated by Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, but there's also, you'll see the green, I mean, excuse me, the orange that stretches up in the Eastern part of the state, that's the Daniel Boone which you can hunt on. There's also the National Wildlife Refuge down here in the western part of the state and some state forests scattered about that allow public access. So really over 1 million acres of public access in the state of Kentucky, which is just phenomenal. And something else I wanted to note about this is that, um, you know, for turkey and deer, access can be limited uh, on some of these locations, but for squirrel, it's almost wide open. So um, to know, just double check, I left a note down there, double check the location's specific regulations, which you can find either in our hunting guide or online. All right, so let's talk about some squirrel processing and cooking, which is probably the best part about squirrel hunting. I love squirrel meat, honestly, I do. Um, and just to reemphasize that you don't have to have fancy camo, I was literally wearing this outfit with blue jeans when I harvested my first fox squirrel. So it can, it, you can just, just have fun. Don't worry about the technicalities. Okay, so squirrel for the table. Um, when you're processing a squirrel, it, it kind of is good practice if you're interested in also harvesting big game. And I'm going to break down a couple different options for processing in just a minute. Um, check thoroughly if you're using a shotgun. Uh, even if you're using a rifle, sometimes that projectile can break up on impact. So check thoroughly in the meat for loose metal and little shot pellets. It is a great substitution for poultry, for, for the dark meat poultry. So if you have a recipe you wanna try that's pretty good with your dark meat poultry, you could probably swap it out for squirrel and it would be maybe even better. Um, it's low in fat. So sometimes you wanna introduce another form of fat when you're cooking. 
And you wanna make sure that you cook your squirrel meat to an internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. I have some of the nutritional facts that I pulled from Outdoor Life. The, there's 147 calories, 26 grams of protein, four grams of fat. So again, it's really low. And um, then the cholesterol is only 103 milligrams. I'm not gonna click on every single one of these and I will send these to you all with our follow-up email, but some really popular dishes for squirrel are squirrel and dumplings, fried squirrel and gravy, which is what you saw I did with my fox squirrel, and then a squirrel pot pie. All of those just sound phenomenal. Okay, so some processing tools. You obviously are gonna need a flat surface. So grab your cutting board, a smaller knife. You don't really need anything big. Some gloves, because that's what we wanna, we wanna protect ourselves uh, when we're handling wild game. A bowl of water, and that's to put the meat in um, after you've taken it off the squirrel, after you've parted things out. Um, game shears or kitchen scissors. These are just handy. You don't really have to have them. Game shears might not be in your budget, um, but it is an option. A trash bag to dispose of the parts that we're not going to keep, and then a cooler and ice for transporting uh, our squirrels back to the house. So let's dive into the methods. <coughs> There are three main methods here. Give me just a second. The first method that I wanted to talk about is the tail method. And this is a pretty nifty trick, but it can also just cause you to go into a little bit more work if it's not done properly and the um, it doesn't pull correctly you really want to use this with a fresh squirrel um, and use like a slow steady pull. You'll see our little diagram there. You make a notch um, above the anus and then you stand on the tail and hold the back feet and you peel the hide off of the squirrel by lifting up with the back feet. Um, so it sounds easy. I encourage you to try it, but if you need to, um, stop halfway because you're catch you're ripping some of the meat, some of the muscle um, or anything like that, it's okay. Um, I've never had any luck with this method myself, but it, it is something you'll see on TV and in some of the videos that I'm gonna send you in your in an email. Um, the next method is the shirt and pants method. It's a little bit more consistent. You're still gonna to wanna to work slowly and carefully because you could still pull the meat while you're pulling on the hide. Uh, essentially, you are making a cut um, on the back and you're working your fingers underneath the one side and the other and pulling in opposite directions, basically undressing the squirrel uh, shirt and pants as if you were putting on shirt and pants or taking them off rather. And then skinning for the fur, which is what I have the most practice with. Um, and this is also the method, if you're gonna big game hunt, you can practice on these little squirrels before you get out with your deer. Um, and it'll really help you hone in those skills. It does take a little bit of time, but it also allows you to save the skin for tanning or using to train dogs. So it's, um, uh, I do have another note. If you, for this skinning for fur method, if you have an ethical headshot, um, you might want to cut the head off before you start skinning it out just for a little bit of ease. And you'll notice on the feet on this diagram, um, I have a little line here. This, this purple line that I hope you can see is your cutting line. And then I have four little cross lines across each of the feet, and that's because you're going to take those off. Any questions up to this point? Just going to double check my chat here. Okay, there is one. Is squirrel meat considered red meat? Um, great question. I think that the answer is yes. Someone 
could correct me if I was wrong. But I think yes. Okay, so I have videos for each of the styles that I talked about. And in the interest of time tonight, we're not going to watch any of them, but I promise to send them to you. And I recommend if you're watching this on YouTube later to um, check some of these out. All right. So that's all I have for my presentation, but I do want to show you one more thing. I have an example here. This is one of the squirrels that we harvested last fall. And this was the skinning for fur option. This guy's still pretty stiff, <laughs> but this is what it'll look like when you're done and after it's dried. We just cured this in salt and you wanna um, pin it down so that the fur is, is down against a flat surface. We just use a piece of cardboard um, and then you salt the top of it really heavily, good, uh, even, all the way across all of the parts of the meat uh, or the skin and a little bit extra here on the tail. You can see his tail got bent in a box, but he's still good. And then later, we just haven't gotten to this point, um, you can tan it to loosen it up. Uh, I actually have seen a really great video, very interesting video on tanning your squirrel hide with eggs. So it can be that simple. Any questions? Let me see, I actually see two comments in the chat. So let's see what they say. Any suggestions for a decent and affordable scope for a 22 rifle? Actually, yes. Um, so the, the scope that I have, oh, sorry about that. The scope that I have on my deer rifle is um, just one that you would buy from Walmart. The brand is escaping me at the moment, but uh, really not super expensive, but also really effective. I love it. Um, I really do. And then Alvin asked if, it, if we were just using regular table salt. Yes, um, just regular old iodized salt. There's some other options that you can definitely explore, but that's pretty simple. Other questions for tonight? All right. Well, with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you everybody for hung that everybody that hung in there with us. <laughs> you can tell it's late. Um, we have had a, real, a lot of fun with this webinar and I hope that you learned a lot. Uh, I hope that you get out there this spring, get some practice in before the fall and then really take advantage of that fall season. It is just, you're gonna enjoy it so much. Um, looks like there was one more question. Since we're talking about spring hunting and long fall seasons, are squirrels as sensitive to scent like sunscreen sweat as, um, as deer and coyotes, et cetera? That's an awesome question. No, um, I love it because I can sweat as much as I want and the squirrels never know I'm there. Uh, so you'll be totally fine with your bug spray and stuff like that. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, just let me know. If you're joining us on YouTube, make sure that you hit the subscribe bell to know when the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife posts new content. Um, and thank you all again. Thank you, Cody, so much for being our guest speaker tonight. Yeah, thanks so much, Becky. And uh, like you mentioned a lot, you know, this is this is a really good introductory hunting species for people, you know. A um, lot of great questions and, and stuff you touched on too. These animals, it's not like deer hunting. They don't uh, spook as much um, if they see you or smell you. Um, and so it's really, really a great thing to try and super long season. Um, and most of those WMAs you saw, <clears throat> they might not be great for turkey hunting, but I bet you most, if not all of them have squirrels on them. Um, so strike out and use some of those um, 
visual indicators we talked about. And best of luck to everybody. everybody. Do not hesitate um, to, to contact me with any further questions.